Brothers, love everyone, and welcome. This week we're continuing our study on the Holy Spirit, on the God is in us series. This week, the message is entitled, A New Mind. So sit back and relax, as always, and let's see what the Spirit has to share with us this week. I want to talk to you for the next few minutes. Um, what kind of day, what kind of month, year, life, what kind of life can you expect to have if you've committed your life or if you're thinking about committing your life to Jesus? What kind of life does the Bible talk about? Not in real general terms, but like, what does the daily life of a person who follows Jesus look like? And actually, a number of times in Scripture, there are some giant, amazing promises that set this vision of this beautiful life that you can have. Uh, The video referenced to a teaching of Jesus. Jesus shows up on the scene uh, at a Jewish feast, a festival, called the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, In the Old Testament, the Jewish people, the very first temple that they had was actually a tent, and it was mobile. And it was representative of the fact that, like, God's presence was with them. God was walking with his people. And so they threw a party. Now, over these seven days of the festival, the best and grandest day was the very last day. And on that day, in John chapter 7, it says that Jesus showed up, and in a very loud voice, He said something that is somewhat unbelievable. He says an extraordinary thing about the kind of life that a very ordinary person like you and like me can have. Now, because we get to look back through 2,000 years of history, we know that Jesus is this amazing man, that he's raised from the dead, that he is part of the Trinity, and that he's making all things new in our world. But for the original hearers of this sermon, Jesus was just a flesh and blood guy. Certainly they had heard about miracles. He was a very curious figure. But when Jesus shows up, imagine him saying this to a whole crowd of people. He says this in a very loud voice. He says, if anyone is thirsty. And what he means by that, is anyone discontent with their life? Does anyone have a desire or a longing or a struggle, something they just can't seem to get their hands on? Is anyone thirsty? He says, because if you are thirsty, you can come to me, Jesus said. And if you come to me and if you follow me, he says, rivers of living water will flow through and out of you. The King James says, uh, rivers of living water will flow out of your belly. You know that part in your gut where when something terrible happens, when you've lost hope or despair, the place that you feel emptiness, the very center, the core of the core, the place where the butterflies fly when you're anxious and nervous and afraid. Jesus said that place, instead of butterflies and instead of emptiness, living water can fill that part so much that it flows out of you. It's unbelievable, an extraordinary life for very ordinary people, Jesus promises. Now, on the other side of this amazing promise is the reality that lots of us live in. It's a reality that David captured in the psalm. In Psalm 42, 1, he paints this little picture of what life is like if you are not able to find living water. Let's take a look at what he says. He says, as the deer pants for streams of water. Sound familiar? This is a pretty popular chorus that lots of Christian folks have sung over the last 25 years or so. As the deer pants for streams of water, my soul pants for you, God. Now, when I was in high school and we sang this song, I would would imagine like a little Bambi crawling up a green uh, forest and lapping up at a river. Like Bambi is a little bit thirsty and needs a little bit of water. That's not what David is talking about. Because David didn't live in Minnesota, where we have the Grand Mississippi and the Minnesota and the St. Croix River. None of us worry if we're going to, uh, to die because of a lack of water. It's not part of our life. But for David, who lived in desert country, the city of Jerusalem didn't have a water source. They had to bring it in. And the way that a deer would survive in the desert, there was these little things called wadis. Can you say that? 
Wadi, good. Wadi is like a little dry trough in the desert that most of the time is dry, but if it rains, that little stream will fill up with water. And if that stream fills up with water, then the deer can drink and live. But if it stays dry and there is no water, that deer is not just going to be a little bit thirsty. That deer is going to die. And Jesus seemed to put his finger on the same thing for you and for me and his earliest followers. If you can't find living water, you're going to die. Your heart may keep beating and you may keep breathing, but inside you're going to die. It's kind of like this. Um, what do we do when there's a gap Jesus promises this life of living water, things like hope and love, life and energy and power to face challenges and circumstances, an overwhelming sense of love and wholeness. This is the kind of life that Jesus said that you can have. Now, we've all done this, right? We've all mastered joy. Our lives are full. We're never grouchy at our kids. We never get in a fight. We never despair or get stuck in a sin pattern. And we've totally mastered humility about all of this, right? We don't have any gap. What happens when there's a gap between the life that Jesus promises and then the life that you and I actually live? Because there's a gap. And we all have to find some way of coping with this gap. So I'm just going to be a little open and honest with you today. These are a few different ways uh, that people can uh, try to bridge this gap. Now, my main way of trying to bridge this gap is I'm gonna try harder. I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and I'm gonna jump over this gap, okay? It's sort of like this. There's this gap between the life that I wanna live, the spiritual life and the life I actually live. And so I decide like, for instance, I hear about somebody who gets up to pray. I decide I need to pray harder. So I hear about somebody who wakes up at 4.30 in the morning to pray. That sounds inspiring, right? So I, I make the commitment. I'm going to get up at 4.30 in the morning and pray. Even though at 4.30 in the morning, I'm dazed and confused. I'm grouchy and irritable. No one wants to be around me at 4.30 in the morning. Even Jesus doesn't want to be with me at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> But I say to myself, this sounds really hard and a struggle. It sounds like it's going to be terrible and painful. So it must be from God. It must be spiritual, right? <laughs> and I do it for a couple of weeks and I pretty much fail at it. And after that, I pick up a big theology book that I'm going to work through. And I make it two chapters through that. And then I try a CD seminar that I'm going to take. And I don't finish that. And one thing after another thing after another thing. And when it doesn't close this gap... I end up at the end of all that effort, just tired, just weary. And it's to people just like me that Jesus said, come to me when you're weary and it's heavy. And Jesus was exactly talking to a group of people who were living under the oppression of a religious system of effort and working harder. And Jesus says, if you come to me, I'll give you rest. The problem is, in the try harder mentality, coming to Jesus sounds like anything but rest. And I'm left with the gap. So some of you might be like me and try harder. Some of you might try something else. You might try to pretend. Let's pretend there is no gap. I mean, we kind of know what it looks like. Jesus said our life is supposed to be full of joy and energy and power and love, peace and patience and kindness. And those things aren't authentically inside of us, but we know enough about what they look like that we can pretend. This happens many Sunday mornings, if not every Sunday morning, when a family of five pulls up in a minivan. All morning long, they've been fighting hell on earth in that van. But as soon as they walk into the doors, everybody knows you better zip it up and behave at church and don't let anybody know that anything's going on. And kids do this, and couples do this, are in the fight of their life on the brink of divorce, and they walk into church and they act like nothing is wrong. It totally happens. But pretending is not going to close that gap. Something else that we try. Uh, we try to change our spiritual venue. I grew up in a Presbyterian church, fairly liturgical hymns and uh, 
candles and altars and, you know, reading the Lord's Prayer and reciting things. And it was a great church. Sunday school, I grew a lot. When I got into high school, there was a Pentecostal church across the street. A friend of mine invited me over there. And boy, did I change spiritual containers. It was crazy. People like swinging from the chandeliers. Services went forever. <laughs> Sermons went all over the place. And I grew a lot. I fell passionately in love with God. And so I grew. I closed the gap for a little bit, but then I stopped making progress. And then I decided, you know what? The sermons are a little shallow. If I went to church, it was a little more theological. So then I went to a Baptist church. It's like, wow, look at the theology of these sermons. And I went from one place to another place to another place, but I didn't close the gap. Because wherever you go, there you are. And the gap doesn't close by changing your circumstances. I'm not saying there's never a good reason to change churches. Don't hear that. But if you're hoping that your spiritual gap is going to get closed by somebody else doing something for you, that's not rivers of living water flowing from inside of you. One of the last things that people try, when they catch this vision or have this hope about the life that Jesus talked about, a life of wholeness and peace and joy and faith. And they're not experiencing it. And there's this gap here. And they've been working on it for a long time. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Some people do this. They just quit. Now they don't stop going to church. They may not stop giving to church. They may not stop serving. They don't stop being a Christian. They want to head off to heaven after they die when the kingdom comes. But they've lost hope that their actual life can look like the life that Jesus promised. But what if there was another way? What if Jesus really knew what he was talking about? And what if he really did mean that an extraordinary life could meet you in your everyday ordinary life? What if he wasn't kidding around? We're going to continue on. Uh, last week, our senior pastor, Greg, gave a strong address to what's currently happening in our city and around the country, around the world. And gave us a reminder of what the kingdom looks like. If you missed last week, you will for sure want to grab the CD or DVD. This week, we take some of those same ideas because that scenario is not over for us, for the city and the country that we live in, the world that we live in. But we pull that storyline into the series that we had originally planned, a series about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, rivers of living water can flow out of you. And he said that that river was one thing. And that one thing that he meant by that river of living water is the Spirit of God. So today I want to talk to you about the primary place where the Spirit of God, the flowing river of God, can meet you in your ordinary life, and that's in your mind. The title of the sermon today is called A New Mind. I would actually love it if you would take your bulletin out. Uh, on the back of your bulletin, there's a spot for notes. Uh, I'm going to say enough information that I, I'm pretty certain you won't be able to take it all with you, but I think that it all could be helpful for you this week. Uh, I'll, I'll try to sort of stay on track and give you uh, clues about when you should write something down and when you should just listen. Um, the key verse that we're going to be in today is in Romans chapter 8. So while you're grabbing that bulletin, uh, I'm going to read these scripture verses off of the side screens. This is Paul writing to the church in Rome. He says this about our minds about their minds, which aren't any different than ours. He said, those who live according to the flesh, according to the natural state of things, those people have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit, which is what we're hoping to do with this series, for those people who are living in the flow of the Spirit, their minds are set on what the Spirit desires. The mind that is governed or ruled by the flesh is what? Death. Death. Come on, you can do better than that. It's what? Death. And the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So I want to talk to you real briefly about your mind. First thing I'd love for you to write down. Your mind is the ceaselessly 
um, is, the, is the ceaseless flow of thoughts and ideas that make up your life. Your mind is the ceaseless flow of thoughts and ideas that make up your life. Your mind is flowing a million miles a minute. More thoughts than you can actually remember than your brain can handle. There's a constant flow of ideas in your mind. You might think about it like this, like it's a wire and each thought is like a little bead along that wire. And from morning to night, and even while you sleep, your mind has a constant flow of these thoughts, and that flow makes up your life. Like, for instance, you might be looking down at your bulletin right now because you just wrote that thought down. You might be wondering, what does Paul mean by this part from Romans? And then you're looking at your bulletin, and you notice your hands. And then you look at your fingernails. And then you think, I'm still biting my fingernails. That's a bad habit. I hope no one sees this. I feel a little embarrassed about my fingernails. And these thoughts just keep going. I bit my nails this week at work because I think my boss is mad at me and I'm worried about that. I sure don't want to lose my job. But man, I get mad at my boss sometimes. I'd like to tell my boss a few things. Man, wouldn't that be something if I could tell my boss all the things that are on my mind? And your mind keeps going. There's a couple sitting in front of us and they're holding hands. Why doesn't my husband hold my hand anymore? They look happier than us. I think their marriage must be better than our marriage. That guy up on stage there, he's talking again. Did he just say the word but? I think he said the word but. Now this is your mind. It's a constant ceaseless flow of thoughts, perceptions, ideas that make up your life. Your mind is doing this all of the time. Now, not only is it a constant flow, but actually each one of us have certain patterns that this flow goes along, certain streams of thought. Uh, let me give you a for instance. You meet someone in the gathering area, and that person says, boy, you look really nice today. An optimist thinks, what a nice guy. A pessimist thinks, the lighting must be really low in here, <laughs> right? A narcissist thinks, I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> the cynic thinks, this person must be recruiting me into children's ministry right now. <laughs> a side note, we do need some help in children's ministry. So if you've got one or two weekends and can help out, you should head out to the information table afterwards. It would be terribly sad if kids' classrooms were closed on a weekend uh, when all the power that we need is right in this room to keep them open. Amen? Right. Yeah. This is your life. Your life is made up of patterns of thought that steer the direction of your life. Every thought along this little flow has power. Now, every thought that you have, not only is it like an intellectual thought, but it also carries a little emotional charge with it. I just want to pause and say, there's three people I'm very indebted to for these ideas. Uh, one of them is Dallas Willard. Uh, he wrote a book called Renovation of the Heart. Uh, the second is a teaching pastor in San Francisco named John Orberg, who wrote a book called God is Closer Than You Think. Uh, and then the third one uh, is the chair of the psychology department at USC, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, you should try to say that fast 10 times, uh, who wrote a book called Flow. Th these ideas that I'm sharing with you are from those three sources. Each thought along this flow carries a little emotional charge. And Paul in Romans reminds us that each thought along this flow of our mind also carries a little spiritual charge. Every single thought that comes into your mind has power. It either is leading you towards life or it's leading you towards death. All of your years are made up of months, are made up of days, are made up of moments. In each one of those moments, there's a ceaseless flow of thoughts coming in your mind that you have developed patterns of thinking. And each one of those thoughts has the power to lead you towards life or lead you towards death, and your mind is the primary place where the Spirit wants to meet you. The problem is, uh, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, uh, they did a study over multiple years with uh, thousands of participants. They wore little pagers. 
Uh, and those pages would go off. And when they did, the participants had to write down, where are you at? What are you doing? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? And hundreds of thousands of pages of that data, and it's empirically proven that the normal state of the human mind when it is not distracted or guided by some kind of spiritual practice, the normal state of our human mind, where do you think it always leads towards? It always leads to death. Here's the four overwhelming responses of what characterize a, a, a non-distracted mind in our society. Consistent thoughts of discontentment or anger. I'm not happy with my life. Inadequacy. I'm not enough. I don't have the power to face the challenges that are coming at me. Anxiety about the future. What's going to happen to me? I can't be certain. And constant self-preoccupation. Because these are our minds. These are the ways that our minds naturally need to go. Why do you think that the worst punishment that you give a child is a timeout? Why do we do that? I know why my parents did it. I was a terrible child. My parents tried everything they possibly could. Uh, over the years of me sharing here, maybe I'll share with you uh, some of the creative ways that my parents tried to discipline me, as long as you sign a waiver form that you won't use any of them, okay? But when I was really bad, then my, my parents would sit me in a chair in the middle of my room, and my job was to sit there, and then my dad would say what all parents do. I want you to sit here and what? Think about what you did wrong, right? What's the worst kind of punishment that we give prisoners? Solitary confinement. Do you know why? Because people hate to be alone with their own minds. Paul talks about this in another part of Romans. He talks about being given over to a depraved mind. You see, if you put someone in a cell and you leave them, uh, the, their only companion in that cell is their mind, and the thing that their mind is consistently focused on is discontentment and inadequacy and anxiety and self-preoccupation. You don't have to torture someone from the outside. You can just leave them there, and they will torture themselves. It's a brutal picture. These are our minds. The natural place that our mind goes is to death. So if each thought that I have has the power to lead to life or lead to death, how do I know which one is which? I'm glad you asked. I have a brief list. The mind controlled by the flesh, the mind that leads to death versus the mind that leads to hope. How do I know when the spirit is flowing in my life and trying to guide my mind, how do I know which thoughts should I listen to? The thoughts that come from the kingdom of heaven, from the spirit, always point towards hope, never towards despair. That's totally a typo. Thoughts that come from the Spirit always lead towards virtue, never towards sin. The Holy Spirit never guides us towards sin. Always towards truth, never towards illusion or pretending. Always towards growth, never towards stagnation. Always towards love and never towards arrogance. Uh, one more I left at the bottom. Always towards dogs, never towards cats. <laughs> Life and death, right? These are our minds. They're unceaseless. They're a constantly flowing stream out of which our lives are formed. And those things go along patterns. And those patterns determine our life. And every one of our thoughts has power. In every moment, every thought has the power to lead you to life or lead you to death. And leading towards life is a beautiful picture. And leading towards death is a terrible one. And leaving your mind on its own power will lead towards death. But I have some good news for you. Jesus, when he left his disciples, said that he was going to send power. He said, you will receive power. And they did. And I want you to know that one of the primary powers that the Holy Spirit gives you is the power to choose what you will allow your mind to think about because it is the stream from which your life flows. I'd love for us to actually to read out loud a quote from Dallas Willard's book, Renovation of the Heart. I'd love to hear you say it nice and loud, and I'd love to hear us all read it together. Can we bring up the slide? 
All right, here we go. All together now. The ultimate freedom we have as human beings is the power to select what we will allow or require our minds to dwell upon. You have the power to choose what you will allow or even require your mind to think about. There is a myth in our day that the constant flow of emotions, the constant thing in our mind, or the environment that we find ourselves in, that we're a prisoner to those and that we can't do anything about it. All we can do is be tossed back and forth. That is not the picture in the New Testament. You have the power to choose, not because you have the power, but because the God of the universe, who is immensely powerful, is in you and will help you with this task. Now, let me say something here real quick. I for certain would love for all of us to leave empowered, for us to say, I can think about my thinking and I can choose what it is I think about. However, for lots of us in the room, our, our brain chemistry, our backgrounds and upbringing mean that we need help with this. I am not saying that if you're on some kind of medication that's helping you or if you're in therapy and counseling, that that's some kind of weakness, that's strength. You should keep working with that. I'm saying we should do whatever we can to get the help that we need and to look to the Holy Spirit to empower us to choose what we will think about. So I have a couple of instructions. I'd love for you to write this on the back of your bulletin. These are challenges of ways that we can take the flow that's in our mind and line it up with the flow of the Holy Spirit. The first one comes from Colossians chapter 3. Let's take a look at what Paul says here. He says, set your mind on things above not on earthly things. Notice it's an active verb. He doesn't say hope that your mind will drift towards things above. He says you take leadership of your mind and set it on things above. Now what I used to think when I was a little younger was this means I'm supposed to like dream about heaven. The problem is the Bible isn't really clear. It's a little bit fuzzy about what things look like in heaven. Uh, so just, to, uh, just a little experiment here, real quick. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have you turn to your neighbor, and I want you two to talk about it, decide together. Does God have a beard or no beard? Okay, go ahead and chat real quick. Beard or no beard? Share with your neighbor. Okay, that's plenty. Let's come back together. All right. Okay, the... I've lost the crowd. All right. Okay, beard or no beard, what's the correct answer? Beard. No, the correct answer is God is spirit. The beard thing we just make up, okay? All right, uh, second one. Uh, does God wear a robe or a pinstripe suit? Turn to your neighbor, you guys decide together. Robe, pinstripe suit, which one? Okay, what's the correct answer? God is spirit. You guys are doing so much better than the nine o'clock on Saturday night. Last question. Uh, is God blonde, a brunette, a redhead, or white hair? Which one of those four? Talk quickly. Which one is it? Which one is it? God is what? No, actually on this one, I think God is partial to baldness. So God is bald. <laughs> kidding. Totally kidding. All right. We're not supposed to sort of imagine or dream about white-haired, bearded, robed people. When he says, set your mind on things above, I mean, set your mind on the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is any place where God's will and heart and passion flow unhindered and uninterrupted. What does life look like when that happens? What does love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and beauty and confidence and trust. Those are things that we can set our minds on instead of this thought. I just had a fight with my daughter on the way to church today. I'm not saying this is my story. I'm saying let's say you have this one. I got in a fight again with my daughter and our relationship is deteriorating. We just can't seem to get along. I don't think I'll ever have the kind of mother-daughter relationship that I dream about. Is that thought leading towards life or death? Death, death right? And yet this, is, this can be the natural flow of our minds. And Paul just challenged us, don't set your mind on that. You have the power to choose what you will require your mind to dwell upon. So use it, the spirit can help you. 
Now we know that we're not alone in this work, right? We both have a helper in the Holy Spirit, and we also have someone working against us in the enemy. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. Uh, in the second half of it, he said, We take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. You have a thought. You look at that thought and say, okay, is this, is this leading to life or is this leading to death? And if it's death, then capture it, right? Every night at 10 o'clock, Lucifer and all of his demons have been developing a thought that gets sent directly into my brain after a full day of development, and it goes right in my brain, and what pops into my head is mint chip ice cream. The problem is in two weeks, I'm going to be in my sunny home in California, and ice cream is not going to help me. So then I think to myself, is this thought life or death? And I say, God, if it's your will for me to have mint chip ice cream, then when I go to the freezer, let it be in there. And I go to the freezer, is it in there? No, it's not in there. Okay, God, if it's your will, let there be a parking spot open in front of Izzy's ice cream. And sure enough, my 10th trip around the block, there's a parking spot open. <laughs> Say, thank you, Lord, right? We can totally fool ourselves with this. But the thoughts that lead to love and hope and life, we should dwell on those. And the ones that lead to death, we should take captive. Third thing. So the first one is set your mind on things above. The second one is take every thought captive. The third one is you have to lean into Christian community. There's an amazing movie called The Beautiful Mind about a guy named John Nash, an incredible mind. It was incredibly genius and also incredibly broken. He would have delusions of grandeur. He would imagine people telling him things. He didn't know what was real and what wasn't real. Over time, he got help, and he developed the ability to stop listening to some voices and learn how to listen to others. Towards the end of the movie, someone approaches him. Uh, they're letting him know that he's going to be given the Nobel Prize. Now, this is the kind of thing that's happened to him before, and he can't quite trust his mind. So imagine this. A genius about to be Nobel Prize winner has to turn to a college student and ask them, do you see a person right here in front of me? Is this person real? And they nod their head. And then he turns back to the person and says, okay, I'll listen to you now. You need help. The patterns that flow into your mind, understanding which ones lead to life and which ones lead to death. Not only do you need the help of the Holy Spirit, you need the help of each other. You need Christian community. You need the ability for someone to know you well, for you to say, is this, does this real? Is this going to lead to life? Is this going to lead to death? And the truth of the matter is there's other people who need your help. If you've been coming on the weekends and you haven't gotten connected or built relationships, I just want to challenge you. You're missing a key component that you need and you're holding back a key resource that other people need. Would you step up and would you get connected? The last thing that I would say is it takes time. You can't make yourself new in your mind, but you can be made new by working together with the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that you have to try harder and exhaust yourself mentally. I'm also saying that you can't stand back and just go, okay, Holy Spirit, take control. Because the Holy Spirit wants to empower you to be the leader of your own mind and wants to empower you to do that. It takes work. One other thing I'd say before I'm going to wrap up. Um, I don't know if you know this, but our city is being swept up by this movement called Pokemon Go. Have you heard of this? If you haven't heard of it, you're probably just too old. That's okay. Right? Pokemon Go, you move around the city, you find the Pokemon, you try to feed them power balls, you make them stronger. You can move from level 1 to level 2 to level 10 to level 15. Right? It's the same thing with this fight in your mind. 
If you move from level 1 to level 10, you will get better and stronger. Trust me, if you work on this, you will. But I also have to warn you, the stronger and the better that you get, the more the enemy will get stronger and work against you. It won't be easy on any level. Jesus never promised easy. There's only one thing that he said was easy, and it was his yoke. But he never promised an easy life. This is hard work, but it should be. Because it leads to life and hope and beauty and peace and patience and kindness. And we know those things don't come easy in our world. At the very end of the scriptures, you know, the Bible opens with this scene in a garden with two trees, one tree of life, and a river runs right through the garden. And Jesus picks up on that theme like he did in the video. He said, rivers of living water they flow out of me, Jesus said, because he's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he said that they can flow out of you too because you can be the temple of the Spirit. And he said those rivers of living water can flow out of you. Notice he didn't say that those rivers of living water can fill you up. Because it's God's design and intention that the living water that God has flows through his people to the people who are thirsty. Does anybody know anyone in our city who's thirsty? who's discontent and anxious and struggling without hope. Anyone know anybody like that in our city? In your neighborhood? In your workplace? In your home? The very last picture that we get in the book of Revelation, there's a river running again in that garden. This time there's two trees, but it's not the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. It's two trees of life, and the river runs right through the middle. And the writer of Revelation says the leaves on that tree are for the healing of the nations. Do you know a nation that needs healing? See, this stuff isn't just so that our minds can get healed up so that we can have a happier, better, more peaceful, more serene life. It's more important than that. If our minds can flow with the flow of the Holy Spirit, we can offer hope and we can bring love and we can be overflowing with joy regardless of the circumstances that we live in. Not a fake false joy that's pretending, but a joy that comes because God's Spirit is moving in and through us. All right, would you stand to your feet? I want to close in prayer. Uh, I got word uh, just before the service started. Um, some of you, if you're tuned in by your phones, you might uh, know this. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, between four and seven officers shot. At least two of them are dead. And the, the fight continues. And sometimes like today, after the string of days that we had, it just looks like evil's going to win. And there's no way that love can win. But you know that that's not the truth. And it's looked like this before. The very darkest day that we've ever seen on the earth was so dark, not just emotionally and spiritually, but physically. The sun didn't shine for hours when the God who came in flesh to do nothing but love his people was murdered by his people, hung on a cross. And when that man died, the earth went dark. And when it looks like darkness is going to win, we have this promise. It comes from the scripture. And Jesus came. Jesus is the light. And scripture says, the darkness shall not overcome it. It shall not. Rivers of living water. <laughs> yeah. Rivers of life. Jesus said, come to me if you're thirsty. If you're thirsty for something, you can come to me and I can give you rivers of living water that will fuel you and it will quench the thirst of those around you. Let's be part of that, huh? Join me in a prayer. God, this is your world. It belongs to you. It is claimed by a ruler who has no right to it. And God, we, your people, we are citizens of your kingdom. We want to be the people who live in the place where your will is done unhindered. 
I pray that we would leave this place prepared and empowered to walk in the Spirit. You're in us, and you not only want to meet us, you want to use our lives to quench the thirst of those people that are around us. And you want to do it today, and you want to do it tomorrow in real and ordinary and also powerful and extraordinary ways. God, use us. In your name we pray. Amen. Prayer team is going to be up front to pray with you. Have a good week. So remember, brothers and sisters, in order to have the streams of living water flow out of us, first they have to flow into us. So I invite you all to come to Jesus if you're thirsty. And you truly will thirst no more. And you'll be able to share all the love that he has for you with others. So let's go to that river. I know a place where we can go to lay the troubles down eating your soul. I know a place where mercy flows. Take the stains, make you wider than snow. Like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current that moves and makes it come alive. Living water that brings a dead to life. Oh, 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 we're going down. telling you when you've been washed by that living water you truly will never be the same when you feel the indescribable love of the father man you rise up in amazing grace and you're going to want to tell everybody what it's like you're going to want to testify
can be satisfied There is a peace, there is a love You can get lost inside Come to the fountain and Let me hear you testify Into the wild Canyons of you Oh, there's a world to fall into Weightless will dance Like kids on Yes, it's truly a love and a peace that you can get lost in. You know, as the message said, it's all about that battle in our mind, taking our thoughts captive, remembering the truth of what the Father tells us, and getting rid of the lies that the enemy fills us with. You know, at this moment in time, the enemy did a pretty heavy attack on me last week through family and I was upset for a day and wondering around and wondering what I'm gonna do and how am I gonna fix it and what's gonna happen and and then I remembered I took them thoughts captive and I remembered father got this why am I even trying to do anything the best thing I can do is give it to the father and know that he'll see me through and even though nothing has changed physically since last week the problem's still the same I still have no clue how I can fix it 
I have a great peace in knowing that the Father already knows what he's going to do. And he will be glorified through this attack of the enemy. That's sort of what it's all about, brothers and sisters. Do we truly have the faith to give it over to the Father when it seems the darkest? Or do we continue to struggle to figure out how we can fix this situation? I'm telling you, it's a peace beyond all understanding. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I ask that you continue to pray for the children, our fellow brothers and sisters all around this world, and for those still lost in the darkness, so that someday that light can crack through and bring them home. See you next time.